from the Visual Arts Department, and I welcome all of you tonight. I first wanted to thank some of our sponsors, who are the Drescher Center for the Humanities, the Visual Arts Department, the Asian Studies Program, and the Gender and Women's Studies Department. This talk is part of the Humanities Forum series of events, and I want to encourage you to take a look at the other events in this series, either on the flyer we have available or at the Drescher Center website. Um, I also invite you to attend the next Humanities Forum event, which is Tuesday, May 3rd, 4 p.m. That's at the um, uh, Alvin Kuhn Library, right over there, right? Uh, the Lipitz Lecture, is that it? Yeah. Um, socioeconomic Status and Brain Health, Biological, Psychosocial, and Behavioral Pathways by Sherry, Sherry Wallstein. Uh, professor of Psychology at UMBC. So those, that's the next event coming up. All right, on to our present presenter today is Ron Devanini. Is that close enough? Don't worry, my mom never got it right okay, either. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, I just know him as Ron. Um, is a filmmaker, publisher, and founder of Radical Axe Films and Magazine. See, I know how to pronounce Radical Axe, like no brainer, okay. Uh, he, he produced, edited, and directed the feature documentary, The Human Tower, which was shot in India, Chile, and Spain. Recently, he produced The Russian Woodpecker, which won the Grand, Prize, uh, Grand Jury Prize at the 2015 Sundance Film Festival, and it was nominated for Independent Spirit Award as well. He is the co-curator, I mean, co-creator co of the Augmented Reality comic book, okay, I got my phonetics here. <laughs> Priyaz Shakti, which received the 2014 Tribeca Film Institute New Media Fund for from the Ford Foundation. His most recently, his most recent film is the Karma Killings, uh, which is about serial serial killers in India, and he finished that just this month, correct? So it's coming out soon. Okay. So um, without any more time to waste, let's go to Ram. He's going to take the show away. Priya Shakti is an innovative multimedia project that addresses attitudes towards gender-based violence in India and around the world. Hindu gods and their moral tales are integral to the Hindu majority in India and the Indian diasporas. Priya Shakti provides a new narrative and voice in the mythological canon by placing the goddess Parvati, an immortal woman who is a rape survivor, at the center of the story. Central to Priya Shakti is an augmented reality comic book, which uses a popular app to make animation, videos, and other interactive elements pop out of its pages. survived sexual assault and faced the ensuing trauma and social stigma. These pieces are short documentaries, but the women are animated in order to protect their identity. The comic book is available as a print and digital version and free to download worldwide at priyashakti.com. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Ram Devanani. I am the, I, I usually don't stand behind a podium, I'm usually out there walking, but can, it, can people hear me if I step away from yeah, it? Or? Cool. Um, I'm the co-creator of this extraordinary character called Priya and uh, this comic book. And I hope from this presentation and lecture, you'll both be inspired and motivated and also entertained, because I think this project is a beautiful intersection between art, activism, cultural activism, um, cinema, uh, comic books, and also innovative technology. So this entire project started for me back in December 2012. How many of you remember the horrible gang rape that happened on a bus in Delhi? I see a lot of you have. Uh, it was widely covered in the news, and when it happened, this horrific crime in uh, Delhi, 
there was enormous protest, not only in Delhi, but all over the country. I was in Delhi at that time and was involved in those protests. And at one of those protests, I spoke to a Delhi police officer and asked him what he thought about what happened on the bus and what happened to her. And I should mention she eventually died from the horrific wounds that uh, were inflicted on her. And the cop said to me, which got me started on, on all of this, he said, no good girl walks home alone at night. No good girl walks home alone at night, implying that she either deserved it or she provoked the rape. And at that moment, I realized that the problem of sexual violence, gender-based violence, was not necessarily a legal problem, but a cultural problem. So this started me on this one-year journey. I traveled all over India, also into Southeast Asia, speaking with poets, philosophers, NGOs working in gender-based violence issues. And then eventually I interviewed gang rape survivors in India, up in Northern India. And talking with rape survivors and everyone involved in this issue, what, what I learned was immediately that a lot of them wanted to pursue justice, wanted to put the perpetrators behind bars, but they were always being discouraged by the police, in most cases by their family, and definitely by their community, because of the cultural stigma surrounding rape. In fact, one of the women that I interviewed, uh, she was gang raped by a group of men who videographed the rape on their cell phone and threatened her that if she went public or went to the police, she would, they would release the video and also show it to her parents. So she went home that night, burned her clothes, took a shower, never got any medical help, and lived with the trauma for several weeks. And it was only when another woman in a neighboring village was raped by the same group of men did she pursue justice. And she eventually did get it. It was a long ordeal, but she did get it. But throughout that time, her family was stigmatized, her family was thrown out of the village, and eventually her father committed suicide from the shame. Now she did put her, the perpetrators behind bars, but when I interviewed her five years after this, she was still being guarded by a police officer with a semi-automatic machine gun. So whenever she went back to her community, she didn't feel safe. She was always under the threat of death. Now just imagine coming to class as a rape survivor with a cop carrying an AK-47 guarding you. You know, imagine having to live that for the rest of your life. So what does that say? It means a lot of rape survivors are not willing to go through this ordeal because they know what's gonna be ahead of them. So what this does is causes this vicious circle where certain men feel empowered to commit more rape because they feel they can get away with it. And it's all because the shame was put on them, was put on the rape survivors. And I wanted to, so, so at this point, after interviewing all these rape survivors, I decided to work on developing, well actually let me go step back a second. I started researching Hinduism because obviously I was in India. Because Hinduism is very pervasive, it's in every, integrated into every part of Indian culture. And I started reading these stories about how regular village people would call upon the Hindu gods, especially in dire situations. And I thought, what's more dire than the situation now? And also I was fascinated by Hinduism because Hinduism at its core is all about conquering fear. I'm just gonna play a video here. So the video I'm gonna play is, uh, during this whole project, we interviewed on the street in Delhi, random men and asked them what they thought. The basic question we asked was, whose fault was it? And uh, the responses were very surprising. So th this was kind of the, the, 
the, the patriarchy that existed in India and in, in a big city like Delhi as well. And I knew that in order to really address this, I had to approach this using the constructs that exist in India. And in a sense, repackaging or reimagining what, what, what the problem was and bringing it back to Indians. So here is, uh, here's the problem of rape in India from the India's National Crime Bureau. Uh, 34,000 reported rates, rapes, but only 21% of them make it to trial. Now, obviously, these are the reported rapes. There's probably much more that are not reported at all. So the first incarnation of this entire project, after studying Hinduism and, and studying the philosophy of Hinduism, is one of the first things I did was I created a remix film. So as an artist, I thought this might be an interesting way of kind of addressing this. So I took all of these uh, films that were made in the 1970s in uh, Bollywood, these huge Hindu mythological films like Ben-Hur kind of equivalent with massive sets and massive casts. And they, of course, focused on the, the Hindu gods. And the first thing is I took 12 of those films and recut them into a new film that dealt with gender violence. It, of course, the originals never did that. They focused on something entirely, something entirely different. The idea behind this was I was inspired by a project that DJ Spooky, I mean, a lot of you might know who DJ Spooky is. What he did is he took D.W. Griffith's film, Birth of a Nation, which is a highly racist film, and reimagined it in a way that it dealt with race from his point of view, and it compelled Americans to talk about race. So I'm just gonna show one clip from, from one of the films, and all of these videos are on, on my website. You can watch them in, in, in its entirety. Uh, I'm just gonna bring the volume down a little too. Oh, I don't have control actually of the volume. I think, I think once the HDMI connects to it, you can't. Volume, 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 down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I can control it here, I got it. Yeah, I think I do. Father and Lord Shiva lived in complete devotion to each other. They lived in one of the three celestial planes, the heavens, the earth, and Shiva's realm. Shiva's third eye of destruction remained closed. The universe was in balance. There was harmony between the gods and the humans. But this was not to last. The slumbering rage of Shiva would soon awaken. Anyway, that's just a snippet. I mean, that's amazing special effects. I mean, George Lucas back in the 70s couldn't even match that kind of special effects with Star Wars, you know? Um, so that was my first incarnation was these remix films that I, that I used from found footage. And I, I bumped into a friend of mine, Dan Goldman, who's a comic book artist at a story code meetup and showed him the videos and he said, wow, the colors are just extraordinary and vibrant. This should be a comic book. 
So he actually put this in my head that the film should be transformed into a comic book. And both of us, there's uh, Dan right there at the very bottom. Um, so both of us grew up as uh, children reading a very popular comic book series in India, Amitya Chatra Kata, which is a huge comic book series. Started, I think, in the 70s, very popular up into the 80s, 90s. Um, they're old Hindu mythological stories. Actually, there's a copy of one of the comic books there on the left. And in India, growing up, everyone read them. I mean, that's how I learned about Hinduism. That's how a lot of people, as children, learned about Hinduism was through comic books. And um, they were hugely popular. I think over several hundred million children in India read these comic books. And that's, with, with, with Dan's suggestion, we transformed the whole project from a film into a comic book. So I started, now I had to research comic books. I never, I never made a comic book in my life. I never drew one. I, although I did read comic books as a kid, I didn't know too much about them, especially the story structure. And most importantly with comic books, comic books of course are told through images. So the story and the characters and everything serves the images. And the first thing I did is I looked at strong female driven comic books with strong female characters. Of course, um, I looked at Wonder Woman and uh, Supergirl and others, but felt they were all very un unauthentic. They didn't really meet the needs of what this project was. And the other alternative was like Power Girl, which is super hyper sexualized uh, characterization of women. And that was the wrong message to send to teenagers in India is uh, someone like that. So I'm just gonna play a little video that I found on BuzzFeed, which kind of goes into the dilemma that I had in trying to find these, find these characters. My kneecap feels like it's about to rip off and my butt feels like it's about to... Let me find... <laughs> My kneecap feels like it's about to rip off, and my butt feels like it's about to spring off into another dimension. Today, we are going to be trying out the poses that female superheroes are often drawn in in comic books. You know, they look good. I hope I look that good. We'll see. I'm excited. I'm a little nervous. It's a lot of ass in this pose for me. Thankfully, I'm really in touch with my ass, so I'm very excited to get this much closer to it. I know I'm going to look bad. I know it's going to feel bad. I don't think it's going to be easy, but I think it's going to be fun. I think I can do it. You notice how her right hip has popped out? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. I might have lied about <laughs> this being easy. It just scares me because her back is literally like a Z, and no matter how hard I stick my butt out, it's never gonna look like that. It's so hard. I'm fighting so much crime! Because getting ready for crime means putting on a full face of makeup. Wow. <laughs> Feels very sexy. Also, ass out a little. Yeah. <laughs> I'll look at this one more time. Mm -hmm. I'll be fine if I go to the chiropractor later. I'm gonna look, try to look fierce, so don't judge me. <laughs> Dignified. I did not enjoy that. I hate yoga, so I don't know why I thought this would be fun. I wouldn't have made it. I would have been like zapped with some sort of ray. I like started to break a sweat. I can feel it on my eyebrows, like in my back. When you actually put your body in that position, it's totally impossible to do. I think the photo came out pretty well. I did feel pretty badass. I'm pretty cool. And I had a fan blowing my hair in the wind. I don't think that I look bad in the photo, but knowing what I was supposed to try and recreate, it was like such a huge failure in that sense. Like her ass is like a heart shape almost, and mine is just like flat across her drawings, <laughs> and her spine is a Z, and her butt is a bubble, and it's just not something that my body will ever look like. I thought it was really interesting doing this as a plus size woman because I was very conscious of the fact that like my stomach was sticking out in places and the way these women are drawn it's like she's just basically like a life-size Barbie and here I was trying to compete. You can't help but feel like really bad about yourself even though like even if I was Psylocke size I don't have the legs that she has and my torso is not that long. I didn't realize how short my thighs were until this moment 
that's a new thing that I can worry about. I feel like it wasn't fierce enough. I did my best. I'm not going to get mad at my body for not being able to do impossible things. What I was trying to think was that I'm trying to fight crime, but at the same time, I've got to look like beautiful and hot and like a boss ass bitch. I would like to see her, I don't know, in some kind of strength pose instead of like a sex pose. I know that they're not realistic, but I do think that people who read these all the time probably absorb a lot of how they should perceive women's bodies and like what women's bodies should be like, even if they don't know that doing it. It's hard out there for a female superhero, you know? I need to go to like a spa right now. My neck, my back, my, and my crack, you know? <laughs> so obviously I wasn't going to follow Power Girl uh, in creating that. So I looked to comic books and characters in independent comics and also comics from other countries, uh, especially the Burka Avenger, which is a comic book, uh, actually animation series in Pakistan, and uh, Miss Marvel, who is a young Pakistani teenage girl living in Jersey City, fighting crime but also getting through high school. So I, I thought these were more authentic and more realistic and more practical to do. So that's how we came up with the idea of creating Priya. Priya being a rape survivor, a gang rape survivor, who becomes the protagonist of this whole story. And I won't go into the whole comic book story. You can download it for free on our website. Uh, but I'll just go briefly into the very end of it. So one of the critical things about Priya is, unlike other superheroes, she has no superpowers. Although at the very end of the comic book, she does ride a tiger, and I'll explain that shortly. She has no superheroes, um, superpowers. Rather, her power is the power of persuasion. So Priya, although she calls upon the gods, it eventually becomes her, up to her to solve this problem and to address it. At the very end of the story, Priya is thrown out of her community and is living in the jungle and is being stalked by a tiger. And in one panel, she is, uh, before this, she's up in a tree and she climbs down this tree and she looks the tiger in the eye, the tiger, of course, representing fear. She looks the tiger in the eye and speaks a very, very powerful mantra. The mantra is, speak without shame and stand with me and bring about the change you want to see. Speak without shame and stand with me and bring about the change you want to see, which is a reimagination of a very popular saying by Gandhi. And she says that to the tiger, and soon the tiger becomes Shakti, or power. And she rides the tiger back into the village that threw her out. And obviously everyone is scared because they've never seen a woman riding a tiger into town. But soon they hear her, this powerful mantra she speaks, and they start following her from village to village, fighting those patriarchal views and fighting against gender violence. When we created this whole project, we had four principles we wanted to stick with. One was gender-based sexual violence needed to be addressed with sensitivity. With, with sensitivity. Hindu mythology must be carefully used and not to offend cultural traditions. Three, the story must be well written and be very Indian, created by Indians for Indians. And four, we wanted to have an impact component to it. So we partner up with UpniUp, Women Worldwide, which is one of the big NGOs in India that addresses gender-based violence issues and also the issue of sex trafficking. Throughout this whole process, I know a lot of people here are artists as well and filmmakers. Throughout this whole process, one of the things I did is I ended up uh, enrolling in a lot of labs and markets and developing this project, uh, going to labs, understanding how users interact with, with the interactive components, how users sort of read the comic book, what they'll get out of it. Um, and there was a lot of film components, so there was a lot of labs uh, surrounding that. Eventually, we got funding from the Tribeca Film Institute who um, came in as a big supporter for this project. I should mention, up until then, I, I was basically using my, uh, this is kind of weird, funny story. Before, uh, before I started this project, and um, I used to work at Citibank as, a, as vice president there. And I, got a, and I got fired, and I got a severance package. 
So I used that severance package to start this project and also to make a film that eventually won Sundance. So I always say thank you, Citibank, <laughs> for firing me. <laughs> One of the really important things that I, I learned through this whole process of creating this project is field testing. Now, I know a lot of artists don't even think about this. A lot of people in interactive, in creating a comic book to field test a comic. But we, all, we had an impact component to this. So it's really important that the comic book resonates with our audience. And that audience was very specific, which were teenagers, preteens, between 8 and 14 year, years old. So we did uh, small test groups in Mumbai and Delhi and showed them the artwork, got responses, got input, and took that advice and changed things around so it worked for them. That it got them excited and also made sure they learned something as well. Now, one of the really amazing things that came out of the testing is we ended up setting up these comic book creation workshops. What we did is we worked with art centers in, uh, in um, Dharavi, Mumbai, which is the biggest slum in Asia, and also up in Delhi as well. We got comic book mentors to work with the students. First, the students would go out into their community talk with women who have suffered gender-based violence, whether it's rape survivors, or women who experience domestic violence, or women who have experienced things like acid attacks. And they would collect their stories, listen to them, collect their stories, and come back and create a one-page comic book, which they drew themselves. And then, they would, then we would print the comic books out, and then go back into the community and paste them around and try to create a discussion within the community about gender-based violence. Now you have to remember this, this happened several months after the horrible gang rape in India, so there was an enormous amount of tension focused on gender violence. And then eventually Mozilla came in and helped turn the comic books into digital comics so they can share them with their friends and everything. The one thing that I learned from this is that, you know, TV, the internet, is a very passive activity. We're very removed from the actual subject matter and the stories to an extent. Once that two hours is done, we're kind of doing our next thing. But these students, when they went out there and talked to these women who sur sur survived these gender violence problems and were still surviving from them, it was a very active endeavor. The, uh, the mere process of drawing a woman whose face was burned by acid and creating a story from them is something these, these students, these kids will remember for the rest of their lives. And after this workshop, I, I got a grant in New York City to actually set up a lab in New York, through the New York City public school system to help to work with students in New York City and create a curriculum based on this experience in which anyone can download. In fact, the image in the middle is the curriculum. Anyone can download. It's like a six-page curriculum. And you can set up your own comic book creation workshop. Uh, for no cost. It's actually, I estimated the cost is probably less than $25 for paper, pen, materials, things like that. And you just need space and students. So we offer that for free on our website. I'm just going to play a, a quick video of one of our students in New York. Hello. Sorry. Well, I'm Jade, and I'm from, like, I'm in 10th grade. In my drawings, in my cartoons, I always make sure I represent everyone. I always draw, like, women of color in my drawings so that, you know, little girls out there can, like, see themselves in the media. They don't have to feel the same way I felt. Um, here, I'm just, like, I drew a picture of more magazines and TV showing, like, other people that don't look like me and like the way it made me feel like alien kind of you know it says like you know if only people had representation so I wouldn't have to end up feeling so bad about myself which is what I drew in the last panel art nowadays relaxes me and because I have like anxiety I, I get nervous when I talk 
So when I'm drawing, I don't even like know what time it is. Like time flies when I'm drawing, and it like really calms me down. Like nothing else does. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the technological component of this because most of the funding we got for this project was for the interactive, strangely enough. Um, one of the coolest things that we put into the comic and into this entire project is the use of augmented reality. Have anyone experienced augmented reality or ever heard of it? Or Wow, like two people, <laughs> which, is, which is not bad. That's actually probably one more, one more than most people ha um, in, in an audience. Now, this is the comic book. And you look at it, it doesn't look incredibly technologically advanced. It's paper, you know, nothing extraordinary about it. But what you're looking at is probably the most technologically advanced piece of art uh, comic book in, uh, in history. You can scan any of these pages and literally out of the comic book and out of the artwork will pop out animation, video, stories, interactivity, audio. In fact, you can even put yourself into the comic book and have yourself looking back at you from, 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 holding, your, uh, from your holding your device. I, trust me, I sh I sh it's, it's in the video, but if you want to take a look at it, I'll, I'll be happy to show it to you. It will blow your mind. So the idea of augmented reality came to me while I was uh, in Italy and I went to the Sistine Chapel for the first time. At the Sistine Chapel, you know, Michelangelo's extraordinary creation, this extraordinary art of, of, of divinity and, and, uh, and, and of the glory of humanity, I started looking at all these panels and if you've ever been in the Sistine Chapel, they're, they're, they're pretty high up. You can't see everything very clearly. And I thought to myself, there must be a way in which I can scan these panels with my uh, smart device and learn more about them and go deeper into the stories. So this idea sort of formulated in my he head and I learned about augmented reality. I said, yeah, there's a way to do that. There's a way to turn this comic book literally into a pop-up book and a live interactive book, but with a physical entity. The beauty of augmented reality is, uh, if, you ever, if you ever tried virtual reality, you know, having those headsets on your head, you're sort of transported to a different place within that headset. But with augmented reality, you're compelled to interact with the settings around you, with, with the artwork, with the buildings, with anything, the advertising. You, you are still in the real world. So I ended up sending an email to one of the biggest AR companies in the world called Blipar. I sent it to info at blipbar.com, thinking they would never, ever respond to me. In fact, I sent it to a bunch of uh, AR companies, and no one responded, except for this company. They, they replied back in five minutes and said, this is a brilliant project. We want to work with you. We want to give you all the free resources as you can. And ironically, we're just opening up offices in India, and we want this to be the key project for our launch in India. So before I get to the launch, one of the things we did with AR is we started creating street art in uh, Mumbai and Delhi on the sides of walls. And uh, as Dr. Jacob will tell you, this is a very popular thing to do in India. Street art, and I'm not talking about street art like Ban Bansky or anything like that, but street art was, is, a, is a way in India of, to, of advertising, using for politics, even giving information about HIV and, and anything else. So I'm going to show a little video and I'll talk a little bit about the street art.
So those are the first augmented reality uh, street art in India. And what's kind, of, what's kind of extraordinary about that street art is the image that you see Priya sitting on the tiger, it's a reimagination of a very popular image in India of Durga sitting on a tiger. Now Durga is the, is the ultimate goddess of feminine power, of empowerment. But instead of putting a goddess on a tiger, we put a rape survivor on a tiger. And when people, and you can see that in the video, when people go by, they look at the image and they wonder, wait, is that Durga or isn't it Durga? And they're not really sure. But what they always tell us is that's a strong, empowered woman. Now, this, this is sort of the goal we're, of this whole project, is to get the image of Priya, a rape survivor, out there so that people feel comfortable talking about gender violence issues and to challenge those patriarchal views. The biggest problem in India is there is no real discussion. Up until that horrible rape on the bus, there really wasn't a discussion about gender violence. In fact, it was very much relegated and ignored, not only in the public, but also in the media. Now, oh, I should mention something about, else about AR. Now, obviously, AR is, was so little, radically new in India, and a lot of people haven't experienced AR in India. But in India, nearly, I would say, 90% of the population have cell phones, and almost 60% of the population have smart devices. So AR is available to them, and there's so much more in the AR that you can't experience just from the comic book. You can read the comic book and really have an extraordinary experience and story, but within the AR you have the interviews with the rape survivors in their own voices. You have the whole animated, the whole remix film, uh, audio interviews with rape survivors, tons of more content, other comic book art from students who are inspired by Priya Shakti, and so on. Another thing we started doing, this was after the launch, is we started having exhibitions all over the world and uh, also in India in art galleries um, of, of the comic book. And this is one of the first augmented reality comic book exhibitions in uh, New York City. Um, all of the artwork is interactive. We had this up for six months at City Lore, exhibitions in London, Rome, everywhere else. Now the launch, the big launch happened in December 2014 at the Mumbai Film and, uh, Film and Comic Con. Now that Comic Con is huge in India. Hundreds of thousands of teenagers, screaming teenagers, come in there uh, not only experiencing popular comic books, but also pop culture as well. And we had an augmented reality exhibition there. And of course, we gave out printed copies of the comic book away for free to anyone who, who wanted to. It was the most anticipated comic book launch at the Mumbai Comic Con. And when we launched it, boom, the comic book went super viral. Um, we have now over 500,000 downloads of the comic book worldwide. And close to 400 news stories written about the comic book all over the world. In India, when the comic book was launched, there was a discussion around the comic book and especially around how society, Indian society, should treat rape survivors and how we can address in India those patriarchal views. And recently, uh, the United Nations, the UN Women, honored the whole project as a gender equality champion, one of the first comic book characters to be honored by the UN. And you can download the comic book in all these formats for free. We even put it on uh, BitTorrent because we wanted, we wanted people to steal the comic book. Because if you steal the comic book, it becomes even more popular, even though it's free, you know. <laughs> Everyone in India uses BitTorrent for everything. <laughs> um, that was our staff. It was very small. Uh, none of us worked on this full time. Um, all of us had other jobs as well. It was a very small group of people, very small budget, but highly inspired and motivated. The next step we're doing is we're, we're working on right now is school distribution. So we have a Hindi version of the comic book and we're working with uh, both Apniap and also the Lions Club 
and testing the comic book out in about 11 or 12 schools in Delhi and Mumbai, seeing how students respond to it, seeing how the school administration responds to it, and seeing how we can develop a curriculum based on those uh, results. So the next chapter of the comic book we're also working on as well. One of the big things that happened is the World Bank came on as one of our partners and as one of our funding partners and they're working in helping to get this comic book out even further. The next chapter focuses on acid attacks because a lot of the survivors of acid attacks and, and purposeful uh, burn attacks also face the same cultural stigmas that rape survivors face but of course their scars are much more visible. So Priya, our main character, will also be uh, coming back into this comic book. She'll be a reoccurring character in all of the comic books. And this, of course, will be free as well. So in, in, in conclusion, I think the most important thing I want to emphasize from this whole project and, and from the comic book is that change is possible. You have to remember, even though there was a horrible gang rape that happened on that bus, there were also millions and millions of Indians, especially young people, teenagers, college students, all started at the Delhi University. That's where the first protest erupted and then spread all over India. So that, that's something really important to understand. And that's really at the spirit of this whole project is to emphasize that change is possible, that all those students that went out on the street risked their lives fighting against the government saying we had enough we don't want this kind of mistreatment of women in our society that is at the core of this project that change is possible and also i think it's also really important to emphasize the fact that and this attributes to priya's sort of global appeal is that rape is not a problem only in india you know it's a global problem. That's why Priya has been downloaded all over the world. And she resonates as a character, even though we made it for India, for India, for Indians, she really does resonate with people all over the world. So I want to thank you. Appreciate you listening to me. Happy to take questions or even criticism, I'm happy to take. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your talk. I'm um, Amy Bott. I'm in the Gender and Women's Studies Department. So uh, this is really resonant, and, and it's a wonderful project. I was curious if you could tell us a little bit about how it's being received in India, considering the current political climate, both right. between the repression at JNU and other universities across the country, and then also under the Modi regime, right. kind of really cracking down on artists uh, and speaking out against what we, what we know are pretty serious cultural ills. Right. I mean, the, the irony is we released this comic book before um, the BJP came into right. power. And, um, and having known the fact that, because as you know, BJP and they're a very Hindu nationalist party. Uh, and they kind of take on Hindu mythology and those characters and the gods as, as a way of, of stomping out on, on freedom of speech, a lot of freedoms. And um, knowing that I probably would have, I mean, at this moment, we kind of staying away from the government entirely. And we're very careful that we don't connect this project with what they're doing. Um, it's still a very grassroots, with grassroots program. And, and secondly, I should mention, we, we have gotten no government funding from any government. And there's a clear reason why, why, why is that. Although I do believe it's important that the government and private sector get involved in gender violence, I also believe that if you have the government involved in a project like this, it becomes totally uncool. Like every teenager would run away <laughs> from this, knowing that uh, the BJP or, any, or even the Congress party was behind this. Um, so at this moment, we haven't, we haven't strangely enough, uh, we haven't gotten any backlash of any kind, other than critical backlash about the story and things like, which is fine, I accept that as a writer. But we haven't gotten any uh, backlash from the government or NGOs or anyone else about the artwork or the story or the motivation we're trying to do. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm not sure if it's a question or comment. My name is Constantine McCourt, so I'm the Asian Studies Program. Mm -hmm. But the, the issue of rape is horrible, of course. It's link, linked link to so many other social problems like uh, 
uh, cultural preference for males over females. And, and it's also manifested recently in um, pressure on, on women not to enter the workforce. So ironically, even though India is becoming much more, the economy is developing rapidly, women's participation in the labor force is actually decreasing right. because of pressure and, uh, again, patriarchy. So, so how do you get at these, with the larger problems? I mean, right. it's great to attack gender, because, um, great because it's a very specific and outrageous uh, problem, but how do you get to the larger issues? It's uh, actually you bring up a really good point, and uh, I mean I think with the first comic book it's it started this series. So each each chapter of the of the comic book will address certain issues, but I should mention this: the second chapter specifically uh, addresses I think one of the core problems. In fact, the second chapter emphasizes uh, males in the in the, in the second chapter and showing strong, powerful males. And also the also the bullying and problems surrounding being a male in India or just in any culture, and 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 how that can get misdirected to mistreating women. So we do emphasize in the second <coughs> chapter in particular, involving men, uh, involving men and teenagers in the story, and and showing them a positive way of addressing this problem. Uh, I mean that's sort of where I come from as well. I mean I realize pretty quickly in those protests, especially in those protests, there was a lot of men, a lot of uh, teenage boys and, and boys in general that were protesting that in order to address gender violence, it's not just a woman's issue, it's also a man's issue. And you have to sort of, that I think you have to really engage literally at first, in my opinion. And that's what we're trying to do with this comic book. We designed the comic book for basically teenage boys, you know, because we want to send them these alternative narratives that they can follow other than what they get from their patriarchal community or from the media or anything else like that. Thank you. Yes? Is the AR company along for the second chapter? And yeah, I, actually, so, well, I, I mean, uh, none of us expected this project to like take off as it is. In fact, we never even, we weren't even thinking about writing a second chapter. This was going to be kind of a one-off. So when, when the comic book launched, the blip art, you know, emailed me and said, holy cow, what the hell, what, what's going on? Like they never seen so many uses of their, of their app within a span of like six weeks, within <laughs> that span in which we launched it. And, and, and within the AR community, when we launched in December, January, everyone was talking about this comic book. This became like the gold standard of how to tell a story using this technology. Because before this, AR was mostly used for marketing. So you can like s scan this Aquafina bottle and you'll see like advertising popping out of it and, and maybe a little animation and things like that. But it was always used as a marketing tool. We became one of the first people to use AR as a way to tell a story. It's stuck here. So in your TED talk, uh, you uh, you mentioned that you know in response to this uh, incident you were in India at that time, that you uh, you decided though you're a documentary filmmaker right. and, and you're going to be talking about your films tomorrow, um, your doc documentary films tomorrow in Kathy Cook's class, but you decided that that was not the right media. Right. And um, you know, so uh, can you talk a little bit more about sure. that? I mean, you did address it, but. Well, I mean, I, during those protests, I was actually filming those protests as well. And I, I actually, what I first wanted to do, even before the reincarnation of the remix film or the comic, is to make a documentary about what was happening. But I felt, especially at that time, literally within that span of one month in December 2012, that this topic was way too difficult and hot to address. And the documentary would end up being more of a news story rather than a true authentic documentary. I always believe a good documentary is, is telling a great story. It's a narrative. It's, it's almost telling fiction, but in a non-fiction form. And I knew I would never get the access or be able to tell an authentic story. It was just way too difficult to do it. So I pushed that aside and said, what other formats can I look at to tell the problem and how to really address it? And that's where I began this whole long research. Yes? I was really uh, taken with the 
grateful that you spelled out your four kind of guiding principles, your methodology for this work. And uh, you know, the first one was being very sensitive when interviewing the subjects, and then you know, never showing any disrespect for Hinduism. Um, what was the third one? Oh, yeah. For about right. Indians, for Indians, and then the last was having a, a kind of social output of some sort. Okay, so I have a question for you on the sensitivity in terms of, of interacting with the subjects. I'm curious if, if you and your team of interviewers, or the kids when they go out to interview and so forth, round, after they create their output, right, even if it's a social program, the big picture. Do you round back to the subjects? How do you re-engage the subjects who are interviewed and our subjects after right. all? Well, for the videos that I that I I, I and uh, working with NGOs interviewed the rape survivors, the gang rape survivors, and uh, basically it was almost like a documentary interview. So we talked to them, made them made them feel comfortable, and the two that we did interview. Um, that, that appear in the comic book, they wanted to tell their stories and be public about it. But the problem in India is, and maybe it's a problem, maybe it's not, it's, it's a big debate about this. Um, if, if you're a rape survivor, your name, your identity, your image can't be shown anywhere, even if you want to talk about it and be public about it. Uh, it's against the law. So in, in our case, we uh, animated them. Even though their voices are their own, we right. animated their, uh, their character. And, um, and we even did that with the men in the streets in Delhi. We didn't want to show their faces because they kind of represented uh, a lot of other people as well. Um, so in that case, you know, I, 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 I personally haven't re-engaged with the, the two women that I interviewed, but the NGOs are constantly in contact with them. And I, know, I told them to, of course, show the videos to them. Um, and then they know their story inside and out. And, and they actually do a lot of interviews with foreign magazines and news, news people outside of India. Um, the, 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 the gender violence survivors that the students interview, those are all from the local community. So in, in most cases, a lot of them in the community know these, these stories. And, and their names, of course, are not revealed in the, in the comic books they create. But of course, their story is known within their, with, even though you know, Darby's a huge slum, Everyone kind of knows what's happening in that community, you know, knows what's happening in their neighborhood. I so, so I, I, I mean, uh, the students, of course, brought those one-page comic books back to their community, back to the women they interviewed, you know, had them posted around the, um, the, the community as well so, the, so other people can read the stories too. Mm -hmm. So do you have any sense how the women whom you interviewed, the two right. women you interviewed, felt about the outcome of the project? I have to be honest with you, I don't know. I, so it's through the NGOs that I, I hope they got, I, actually I, it's a good, I, good, good, good idea, I should email them and see what, the, what they responded to it. Because yeah. their stories was really important in sort of creating the characters and everything else. I also used a lot of audio stories that I got from Apnea. Um, these were of course women that I didn't interview, that they've interviewed over years and years. And those stories also helped create this sort of richer story as well. And then, and then the third thing is I, I got a lot of reports and um, like critical, critical documentation, uh, um, academic, re academic reports and everything else from the NGOs that I was working with, uh, from the Ford Foundation and everyone else. And those helped me also to really flesh out the story too. Yes. Um, go back to maybe the third point in the guidelines, which is uh, this is uh, more Indian. Right. You want to emphasize, but you did put a quote on Indian. Yeah. And then later on, you did mention how uh, this is simultaneously Indian and global. Right. So maybe you could specify a little more on sure. how that works. Yeah, I mean, I guess the quotes are maybe, uh, maybe that's a bad thing, but, but, but basically, we designed this in India for Indians. You know, we field tested with Indians. Uh, the story, I mean, the important thing about Kriya Shakti is if, if you show it to people in India, they totally get everything. Like all the mythological information, all the metaphors, everything behind it, they totally get it. I, I, I mean, uh, if you show it to Westerners, they might not totally, they might get the story, but they not, might not get all the references that exist in the comic book. So it's very natural for 
people in India, and even, even Indian Americans. I think, I'm sure a lot of you have seen the images and know kind of what we're, what we're driving at. And that was very important to us. We wanted to make that very clear. Um, and when we launched it, like I said, we didn't really plan this to go global in any way. Now, I, I, I do have to emphasize this. When this comic book is predominantly read by people in the up educated working class, middle class, and above, you know, we, there are demographics that we just cannot reach, partially out of resource issues and partially out of uh, India being such a huge country with 1.2 billion people. A lot of people in rural areas, we just haven't been able to reach. A lot of people from people who are not educated, who don't have access to the technology, we, we just not be, be able to reach at this point. You know, our next step is to see how if we can incorporate this into the school system and then reach a broader audience through that. Yeah. There's no more questions. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.